Hello, everyone, and welcome to the annual general meeting of the Gnome Foundation. Um, I'm Meg Ford, and I am part of the outgoing board. Um, and I'm here to welcome the new board of directors for this year. Um, so I'd just like to introduce everyone. Uh, we have uh, Philip Kimento, if you can stand. We have Kat. We have uh, Federico Mina Quintero. Robert McQueen. Carlos Sariano. Alan Day, who is not with us today. And Naritzi Sanchez. And we're ready to start. Okay, so uh, you can also see all of our officer positions up here. Um, just re really quickly to go through it, Alan is our vice president, Carlos is our treasurer, uh, Kat is a board member at large, did I get that right? Okay. <laughs> uh, Federico, vice secret secretary, Philip, secretary, myself, president, and Rob is our vice treasurer. So again, thank you all to the new board. Okay, and uh, we have three outgoing directors who, uh, two, well, I guess Alexander is the only one who's not here, but the other two, can you stand up? Meg and Didier. Thank you so much for your work. Okay, so I just want to give an agenda of what we'll be covering during this meeting. It will be in two parts. You'll get a short break in between. The first part is for us to tell you what has been happening at the foundation and with a project for the past year. And then we will uh, have a break, and then you get to ask us all of your questions. Uh, so pay attention during the first part so that you can ask questions during the second part. And then at the very end, we will be doing our Pants Award, which is, for all of you newcomers, an award that we give to somebody who has made uh, a major impact at GNOME over the last year. So it's always really fun. They actually win pants, so it's a lot of fun. Okay, so for the foundation update, we're going to split this up a little bit too, and I'm going to tell you a bit about what we have done the last year, and then I'm going to call Rob up to tell you a bit about what we'll be doing in the upcoming year. So the first thing is that this board has been, or the, the previous board was really proactive this last year. And as part of that, we decided to do a three-day hack fest in Berlin to go over uh, existing policies and start to offload some of our own sort of menial tasks in order to focus more on the strategy and in order to empower more community members to make decisions that they would be better suited for. And so an example of this is that, uh, well, first of all, we rethought the annual bu budget and started to create new, uh, a new structure to help support our goals. We're going to be doing a lot more of this in this next upcoming year, so um, keep an eye on the budget and kind of like the, the differences among that if you're interested in that. Um, a spending authorization policy. Do you guys know what this is? Anybody heard of it? Okay, Zana knows. Great. Um, this is meant for so that if you all want, um, you know, to put on an event and previously, our, 
all of the emails would come to the board. We would have to deliberate over all of the things like, you want 20 balloons. No, we think that you actually need five balloons for your event, not 20. Um, and this was like a huge part of our board meetings. It ended up um, you know, not being as strategic as we wanted it to be. So we created this spending authorization policy to help make it easier for the executive director to have more input into how money is spent. Um, and then also to create budget holders so that they can start making the financial decisions that uh, the board doesn't really need to be in. We created things like a staff travel policy so that people, uh, our employees could travel to events without you know, going through the board uh, and deliberating all of the little details. Um, all of this is just to say that now that the board has some policies in place, we can now start to focus on more of the strategic things that um, will be coming up this next year. Uh, a big thing that we also did was enact the events code of conduct, which we will be um, putting into place in the upcoming year. And then we started some new committees to help with some of the big tasks that have to be done. So for example, the sponsorship committee is in charge of helping us to raise, to fundraise in general for all of our events and conferences. Uh, the Code of Conduct Committee is helping us to um, implement the Events Code of Conduct. And then the Engagement Committee will be helping to um, allocate funds for all of our marketing and outreach events. This upcoming year, uh, we will have GNOME Asia in Taipei very soon, so August 11th through 13th. And if you, um, I think travel sponsorship calls haven't been formally uh, opened yet, but please submit them already because the deadline is uh, coming up for, for that soon. Um, Las Gnome will be our uh, conference that is focused on flat pack uh, applications and just in general the application ecosystem. That will be happening in Denver in September. We're doing another Foundation Hackfest because we have a lot of work to do again. Um, and then, let's see, the important thing is that we need some more bids for Guadec. We have an intention to, be, to bid in Greece, which is fantastic, and it would be great to have a few other bids. So if you have any ideas, please submit them by August 5th. Um, a big thing coming up in winter is a GNOME privacy internships uh, initiative that we have, and this is to spend the privacy funds that we had raised several years ago. There are more, uh, there's more information about this essentially on the wiki, and we don't have it listed here, but if you just search for GNOME internships privacy, they'll pop up. And if you have any questions, find Carlos because he's the one helping to plan these. Um, okay, so as some of you, most of you already know, we received an anonymous donation of a million dollars, and some of you have already attended Rosanna's talk, so she talked a little bit about what this means for the foundation. But for the rest of you, essentially we have an anonymous donation of up to a million dollars over the next two years. And what this means is that we already have $400,000 in the bank, and we have up until the rest of this calendar year to match up to $100,000. Uh, we are certain that we can make this $100,000 match. Um, it's basically matching any uh, income coming from advisory board members, donations, et cetera. Um, but yeah, so that we're, we feel confident about. The challenge will be this next $500,000 match the previous year, so if you're thinking of making donations, please do them, because it would be great to have that $500,000 matched. Um, that is, I think, it. And then Rob is going to tell you what we plan to do with that money. Yeah, so um, the 
as Nariti was kind of saying, that, that some of the things the board have done um, in the year up to this have been about kind of letting the board step back a little bit and letting um, either committees have more power to do their thing or employees to have more power to do their thing. Um, and the idea is that we really use this donation as an opportunity to, to bootstrap like a, a more impactful foundation. So a foundation that earns more money um, and then spends more money on the project and has more impact on the, the GNOME goals and mission as a whole. Um, so there's kind of two sides to this. Um, as Nuriti says, the, the, the fact is we have matched funding means that we also need to kind of step up what we're doing in terms of fundraising. Um, so the, um, the idea is that we actually recruit somebody who is a development manager, that's the nonprofit kind of term for this, but somebody who their full-time job is building um, that kind of pipeline and those initiatives and those marketing and campaigns that will actually you know, bring um, donations into the foundation. And the kind of flip side of that is uh, a program manager who is in a sense uh, responsible for setting up those uh, investments that the foundation is making to have an impact on the project, to move our mission forward, and actually to make good use of that money. Um, and these kind of feed into each other, right? Because the more effective you are at showing that you can do good things with money, the much better story you have to go back out and say, look, you know, we had this much money, we did these amazing things. Now let's scale that up you know, two times, four times, and let's make the, the foundation a much more impactful and sustainable organization. Um, so yes. Hiring, uh, at least for this year, will reflect the majority of the, of the new donation. Um, so uh, yeah, and if it goes well, more hires will follow. So the idea is that you know, this is the start of a process where we want to bootstrap this kind of virtuous cycle. Um, so get more money in, start to do more things with it, um, and then build on that through 2019. Um, so we have four new employee positions. Um, and we are upgrading uh, Andrea as the, uh, the lead uh, infrastructure uh, team lead to a full-time role. Um, initially, um, we are um, setting up one-year contracts, um, and because we have Neil in place as the executive director, essentially the CEO, then all of the staff will report to him, and Neil will report to the board. So it's again kind of reflecting this um, slightly more sort of strategic role where the board is setting the goals and the board is setting the objectives, but the board isn't like approving each, you know, sheet of paper and this kind of thing. So we can be more effective as a board to kind of think about where the, the foundation is going, um, and then we have the backup of the, the committees and the teams and the employees to, to kind of push that vision forwards. Um, and we are, we are recruiting now. Um, the goal is that we can start to, to interview people over the next month or so, and that we might be able to, to make some, some hires in August. Um, so get these people in, because as Nuriti says, we have a fundraising goal um, we need to hit next year, and so we need to start kind of ramping up for that. Um, I think these have been sort of posted online, et cetera, but uh, you know, infrastructure team lead, um, infrastructure engineer, uh, program coordinator uh, who will be working on the events and the outreach and the initiatives that we're using our, our, our resources for. Um, the development coordinator who's looking at the, the fundraising and initiatives that, that bring that in. Um, and a, a full-time uh, GTK developer uh, as an, uh, a first investment into the technology stack um, for GNOME. I mean, there, there's no shortage of things to choose from. Um, GTK is first on a list, and we would like to basically kind of pilot this and see how it goes and build on an investment of the foundation's resources into the project. So yeah, there we go. Goals of 2019. Um, focus on the expansion um, and continue this evolution of the role of the board. Um, make sure that we empower the committees and, and the employees to, uh, to, to, to do what they were set up to do, do what they were hired to do, and make sure that they're effective and that they've got the resources they need, they have the authority that they need, um, and that we're not making the board a bottleneck um, for these things. Um, we've had some great results over the past year with uh, hackfests um, in different locations and you know, outreaching to different countries, and there's more details on that. But we want to support that, encourage, and invest in those kind of initiatives. Um, and we've been, you know, as part of the policies and things, we've been tidying things up. We need to keep on doing that. Um, Rosanna and Neil are working on a new um, finance system, basically, to, to take better care of, of the numbers and things and make sure that we're able to make good decisions and, and see where we are. Um, so with that, on the money, um, Carlos Soriano has the Treasurer's Report.
Hello, everyone. So now is the funny numbers, right? I <laughs> know uh, I made the, the report, uh, I think, very short and straightforward, so I don't want to bore you. Um, this report doesn't have the $1 million, okay, because this is something very new for us. And, and I mean, we are ramping also from new cash, we are going to Odoo, so there's a lot of moving in the, in the infra, so, you know, I couldn't take a look at, into that yet, but I think th this report will give you a little of overview of the bare bones of the foundation. So basically, the income, um, we have two new advisory board members, Canonical Sister 76, so thank you very much. It's very good to have them. Uh, I think what the budget board meetings is one of the most useful things uh, we have in the foundation. So yeah, it's really good to have them. Um, then we had one off donation of 50,000, uh, which is uh, quite good as well, you know, to, to invest in half fares and things like this. And basically the balance is that for financial year of 2017, it was an income of $259,000. And now for the financial year of 2018, we have an estimate income of $304,000. That, if you do the math, is 45,000 uh, in estimate income versus last year, which is very good because it's, um, well, you will see now here clearly, um, that if you see financial year 2016 versus financial year uh, 2018, we have increased 50% uh, of the income for the foundation, which is really, really good. Um, here, you can see four things, internships, conferences, donations, and advisory board. Uh, in 2015, we have this big donation, which does someone remember? What was it for? Groupon. So for those who doesn't know, uh, we had a trademark issue. Groupon was using NOM for making an, an OS or something like this, I think so. And so we have to, they weren't responding to anything and we had to go into the court uh, with them. Uh, so we needed m a lot of money for that. So yeah, we said we need uh, 80,000 and in the first day we raised uh, 100,000, so it was really good. And Groupon basically said, okay, we are fine, <laughs> go with it. <laughs> we don't want to get into court. Uh, so yeah, that's why we have a very big donation, but in 2016, things get to normal, and then I'm very happy that year over year we have increased the, the income for the NOM Foundation, and partially because of the advisory board um, new members, and then these uh, donations. And you can see that the conference is a good income as well. Uh, one of the goals we have is that um, conferences should be profitable, and that's that should be very good for, for the foundation because that also helps for other sm small events like half fest and things like this. Now, where do we put this income? Basically, for the last year, we have invested in Hackfest. Uh, we have four more than last year. Uh, this is something that I think in general the community really appreciates, the advisory board members are also really appreciate, so it's something that we have to invest. And in marketing, basically last year we had nothing, and this year we have approved, uh, I think, around $6,000 in marketing, and now we are spending a little bit of it, so it, it's quite good that finally we are, we are investing in marketing. And another thing that we have to do for NEO this year is that we are, we are having some trainings for our employees, in this case for the Director of Operations, Rosanna. And we have made some salary adjustments for the sysadmin position, that was uh, Andrea Berry. And we contracted Mapbox for no maps. Uh, we had an issue, probably you saw on the minutes, that uh, um, no maps didn't have any service for, for maps. So we have to basically contract a, a, um, a company that is Mapbox that make a flat deal with us, and it was a very good deal. So um, now you can run uh, no maps because of this. A big chunk of expenses is the GitLab runners. The estimation, I mean, for this year, it's not as much because we are still doing the transition, but the estimation is around 1,500 per month. That is around 22,000 per year, so it's a lot. Uh, sponsors are welcome for that. I thought we have the Gila company that is so far sponsoring, but we cannot, uh, you know, put all, all of our load into the Gila company for that. Um, 
Then we have outreach interns. On the past, uh, usually Red Hat has been sponsoring uh, the outreach interns, but this year Red Hat cooled them, so we, the non foundation paid for the outreach interns, and we paid the last year one and, and this year. Um, so yeah, it was also uh, uh, a little bit of, of money there. Um, if someone is interested, company or something, or you know someone that is interested in sponsoring or rich interns, that is very good, I think, for the, for the project as well. Um, and then this was the first year that we have the whole salary of the, of the ED uh, position, Neil. Uh, so that reflects a lot on the expenses as well. So here you can see, just a four years, um, you can see that it was kind of okay, uh, kind of uh, stable on the 2015, 16, and 17, but then in 18, everything increases, right? Partially because of the employees. And then the conferences, we are paying to Nomesia. And um, yeah, and the estimation is, is like better for this year than for the, for the last year, so you can see that the expenses are, are quite higher. Um, you can also see the events. Compared to the last year, we are increasing a lot as well. This is for the Hackfest and the travels for the Hackfest. Uh, it's something that, as I said, I think the community really appreciates, so we are happy to invest in that. And the administration also increased because of the Gila runners. So the balance. Um, we started with uh, $459,000. In reality, we have more, but those funds are restricted. That means they are for GIMP, or that is another organization under our umbrella, uh, not GIMP. Um, who was it, PTV? Yeah, right, yeah. So we are managing their, their funds, but uh, they are another organization, so we have their money, but we, we cannot play with them, uh, with that money. So basically, this is uh, the actual reserve we can play with. Um, the projected income for 2018 is uh, 304,000, and the project expenditure is uh, 421,000. So if you make the counts, uh, we have, uh, the projection is that we have a deficit of 116,000. It's the first time, I think, in the last years that we have a deficit, and it's totally on purpose. We wanted to invest also because of the expansion and, 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 well, and because we have an employee, which is the ED and everything. And this is fine because we have been very conservative and we truly need to, to start investing. Um, on the other hand, this is also a challenge because we have to bounce back. And so the plan is that um, in two years we are bouncing back to, to be um, stable again. So the estimate balance at the end of the fiscal year is going to be 343,000. And that is... Um, 94,000 more than our, our required reserve because we have a policy for that for employees and, and infrastructure and everything that we have to have a minimum of reserves and that, that is um, the 249,000. And so with this in mind, how we can increase the income, basically we have a few ideas, and with expansion that's going to change a lot, this budget is going to change a lot as well, but in general I think the ideas that we have and we are confident to get is that we want to do more targeted campaigns now that we know how to spend the money of the privacy campaign, that we have shown that we can spend that money, we want to create uh, campaigns uh, more regularly, and it's something that really works in other non-profits. Another thing is that we really want to increase the sponsorship of, of the conferences uh, because it's something that also works quite well for the other uh, non-profits. And we know that the Friends of NOM has been a little bit um, you know, stuck or not working very well. We really want to reward that thing because I think uh, monthly subscriptions uh, that are recurrent are very good also for the foundation um, stability and income. And lately, I think we have uh, room for new advisory board members, and we are looking forward for that as well. So, in general, uh, I think we are quite good. It's true that we have challenges, but it's challenges that we, have, we wanted to get into. So, I think we are quite good in that. Um, and now, I'm going to handle to Kat for talking about the committees. Hello everyone. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about committees and I'll introduce the teams as well. For those of you who are new to GNOME, the difference between committees and teams is that committees are appointed by the board and the teams are self-appointing. 
Uh, they are basically teams uh, from within the GNOME community who want to work in a specific area or target some specific thing that they want to achieve. Uh, so first I'll go over the committees. We have, uh, oops, wrong direction. Uh, we have the travel committee, which has been reappointed this year. The travel committee deals primarily with uh, travel sponsorship and accommodation sponsorship for foundation members attending GNOME events. It does also accept requests from people from outside of the foundation and also for non-GNOME events as well, but primarily it's things like hackfests and conferences. Uh, membership committee has also been reappointed this year. Uh, the membership committee deals with the elections, the board elections, and also with the foundation membership. They do a very good job of that. Code of conduct committee is a new one. Uh, their task will be to basically um, improve and implement the code of conduct. Engagement committee is also a new one this year. Uh, the engagement committee will deal with an engagement budget that they can spend as they see fit on promoting GNOME, marketing, engagement, and so on. And sponsorship committee is also a new one, and it's one that I personally feel especially happy about uh, because they help tie together all the sponsorship requests between different conferences and events and actually introduce a, some continuity so that it's easier to get more sponsorship for hackfests and for conferences. Uh, as you guys can probably see, there is at least one board liaison on, on, on every committee and that is to make sure that we actually have better communication between those committees and the board in the future. And now over to the team presentations. Petter is up first with documentation and translation. the honor to, to present on two teams and uh, that's because um, I used to present on translation teams but then I volunteered Alex Franke to do that but he's not here unfortunately so I have to do that again. Uh, all right so um, uh, to be honest I'm not that much involved in translations these days anymore so it's a bit unfair to the actual translators who should be uh, standing here but uh, basically uh, when I look at the stats for GNOME uh, 328 uh, uh, for stable release, we had uh, around 30 language teams with over 90% of uh, uh, translating strings in core modules in the core set of GNOME components and applications. So I think that's, that's a very stable number and I think that the translation teams are still going very strong. And then we look at the headcount there. I think that they are actually the biggest um, group of contributors in in the GNOME project because there are so many languages and there are so many teams and so many translators with them. So I would like to uh, thank them, you know, for their for their hard work. Uh, I would also like to thank Claude Paro, who still, uh, after so many years. Uh, contributes and uh, develops our Django application, uh, which is the bone of the translation infrastructure called Demlies. It runs on L10 and no more if you want to have a look. And he recently uh, added some new features such as support for Mason uh, build system and other stuff. So, so again, this infrastructure I think is pretty stable and works uh, quite well. And uh, that will probably uh, be it for the translation side. Uh, for the documentation project, um, <clears throat> there is some work in progress uh, for the help viewer called the help, uh, such as uh, providing uh, or having a search provider for full text uh, search of uh, help files installed locally that could potentially make the you know, help files 
that you install with apps and with the core components uh, more accessible to the user. Uh, so we'll see if we can merge it in time for the upcoming release. Uh, as for the content, uh, the documentation team these days mostly uh, works on uh, uh, the core user guide and the sysadmin guide. Uh, we are seeing some new uh, contributors coming from Ubuntu folks uh, and other teams, so this is great improvement over the past years when it was mostly just known people or known core contributors. We also are seeing uh, uh, more updates to the English docs from translators who translate the content, you know, often find something that's outdated and submit a merge request in GitLab, so that's also great. And I don't want to uh, specifically talk about developer documentation because that's somewhat uh, uh, different and the documentation team currently doesn't focus on it. There have been some discussions around that uh, topic, but uh, in the future I would love to, I would love those you know, who have ideas and visions around that uh, area to share them with the documentation team because the documentation team or the documentation project if the infrastructure that's, you know, we have it here for, you know, uh, meeting our documentation needs. So uh, keep us in, in the loop uh, when you have discussions about that topic. And finally, uh, on Monday uh, in the afternoon, uh, we have a documentation and translations meetup. So everyone who is interested in documentation, even developer docu uh, documentation or translations, uh, uh, whether you are a translator, documentation per person or developer, or you just wanna chat with us, uh, share your ideas, just come to the to room uh, six, uh, and we will be there in the afternoon on Monday. So I hope to see you there, thank you. Next up, we have a presentation from Andrea about infrastructure. Hello, everyone. Um, so first of all, it's been, uh, it was probably 2014 since I last did um, a recap about the GNOME infrastructure in general. So first of all, let me present out who's on the team today. Uh, mainly me, Patrick Uterweik, Olaf Vitters, and Owen Taylor. Um, I'm currently coordinating the team and um, planning all the possible and future changes that uh, we have in mind for the economic infrastructure in general. Um, so I'll be mainly presenting uh, from the hardware to the software point of view. So on the other side, we've been retiring uh, several boxes, several bare metal instances um, that were end of life. Um, we also, thanks to the GNOME Foundation and Red Hat, we were able to receive uh, warranty renewals for our, uh, for our hardware. And we have, uh, in the plans, receiving additional hardware to replace the, 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 the bare metals that are going to be uh, end of life uh, in uh, um, 2019 and 2020. Um, on the services side, there have been a lot of changes. Um, mainly, um, I'll be discussing the CK to GitLab move on the next slide because that's actually a major change in the way we, we, we host our VCS repositories. But mainly, we moved away from using originally Starcom. We were using Starcom as our CA. Then Starcom was removed from the majority of browsers. And we moved to Gandhi. And from Gandhi, we finally moved to Let's Encrypt. We were using Let's Encrypt everywhere. And also using their wildcard functionality that they introduced a few months ago. The only certificate that we're still using that is still uh, Gandhi is the multi-sign one for IRC gnome.org because 
IRC.org is actually divided and split into multiple servers, and these servers are also at different facilities, which we don't own. So some are, are uh, located uh, on universities, some other nonprofits. So we provide them a multi sum certificate that has a cost. Um, other than that, we've been introducing Ansible. So to, as of today, we're using Ansible as a way to automate some of the tasks that we were used to do manually. For example, one of them is um, renewing VPN certificates for uh, VMs or uh, bare metals that are not hosted within Phoenix 2, which is our main data center, kindly hosted by Red Hat. Um, so Ansible, we use Ansible functionality for automating tasks. And we still use Puppet. We heavily use Puppet still. And we did a major uh, refactor of Puppet uh, during the last year. And we also did upgrade it from Puppet 2 to the Puppet 3.5 um, uh, series. Um, want you to, I would like to talk about what have been the major uh, news for the GNOME Foundation, the GNOME project um, this year, which has been the SIGIT to GitLab uh, migration. This is a huge milestone for the GNOME project. Uh, you guys. <laughs> you guys know I was used to work before. Uh, we had uh, a web UI called SIGIT. It was mainly read-only, and it was a view on the user repository. Right now, thanks to Carlos, and thanks to the GNOME infrastructure team, and thanks to, thanks to GitLab in general, because they've provided a huge amount of support fixing uh, the issues that we found while testing our PSC, our original PSC for, for the GitLab platform, uh, we are now able to have a built-in uh, read write in web UI, um, CLI, uh, a full compliant API we can use to do all the kind of things that GitLab allows us to do. We have, most importantly, uh, a CI and CD uh, built in into the platform. And on that side, we now have, um, we split between what they define local builders. Local builders are standalone instances that we use to build um, repositories and software in general. And whenever the queue for those is full, we have on-demand builders that are spun up into uh, AWS and DigitalOcean. I would like to thank Javier Jardin for this work because he was the one taking care of building up all the build infrastructure in general. Uh, so thanks, Javier wherever you in, 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 in this room. Um, I would like to follow up on the news that we are hiring a new uh, system engineer, infrastructure engineer uh, position. Uh, I would like to amend um, some of the, uh, the, word, the, the wording that was used on the job description because more than a sysadmin, which is a concept that was, you know, common in the 80s. We're looking for a person that knows how to program, uh, knows the networking layer, the OS layer, uh, and knows how to put all these layers together in order to provide an infrastructure that works for all the developers. The idea is having is generating a platform that allows GNOME developers to abstract, to totally abstract the infrastructure that, that is um, on, 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 the, on the building uh, of their application. So they, what they can do is mainly clicking on a build and all apps magically. Uh, this, the service that is based on that specific software gets deployed automatically so that uh, developers don't have to think about infrastructure in general. Um, so this person is going to help me out building the next generation GNOME infrastructure. As of today, what we have, and I'm moving to the future plans, as of today, what we have is mainly 
we're using, we've been using the equation of service services equals to VM, which has worked nicely till now. We probably want to rework that out. My idea in there is moving towards uh, OpenShift, which is the uh, Red Hat platform based on Google's Kubernetes. Um, that way, we will have a, a way to bend um, GitLab directly to, to, uh, to OpenShift and move all the services long term because this is going to be a huge project. It's not going to happen uh, from today to tomorrow for obvious reasons. So the plan that I have in mind is moving as much services as possible uh, into OpenShift that will allow us to have more redundancy, load balancing, and all the features that Kubernetes and OpenShift uh, provides us. That should be all. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. Next up is the design team with Tobias. Who is over there? Oh, oh we're having JMAC. Hello, everybody. I'll disappoint you. You're not getting a young, new addition to the design team. We're going to get the old thought. And uh, uh, usually you're seeing uh, Alan, a well-spoken Englishman. You're going to get me. But at least the, the good side is that I don't remember things, so it's going to be very short, uh, <laughs> giving you a status report of the design team. Now, I'll start uh, positively in that uh, we've gained a very uh, crucial member uh, to the design team, and that is Tobias uh, Bernard, <laughs> who's, uh, who's very short, shortly with us, but he's already like, uh, inspired a number of projects that uh, I will hint to. So uh, since, we, since Alan spoke to you uh, last time, uh, there's been things happening uh, directly in GNOME, but also um, linked to GNOME, and that's mainly uh, Flatpak and the FlatHub efforts that we've been involved in for a long time before Jorge actually, uh, you know, um, did all the groundwork for the actual uh, app index. Um, on FlatHub, we maintain sort of a, a static website uh, that um, offered something uh, in, the, in the meantime. Um, Alan, I shouldn't say Alan, I should say the design team did uh, a lot of uh, documentation for Flatpak itself. Um, um, and we also still maintain the Flatpak uh, website. So that's been a, a large part of what we do. Um, we've, uh, uh, in, in three, was it 26 or 28, uh, redesigned the, uh, the uh, settings shell. So that was a big change. And um, some of the panels, um, individual configurations have been redesigned, like the display panel. Um, but an event that was uh, worth noting that we've been to was last year in November. We all went to uh, London for a UX event because we've been focusing on, on apps, and I still believe that that's a great focus um, to be uh, focusing on the apps, but uh, we've kind of uh, neglected or didn't have the resources or focus to um, uh, go back to the core uh, experience. So there was a, um, um, a hackfest in London where we focused on some of the key things uh, in the shell, and that was the something you uh, are probably familiar with because it was publicized. Because it's like the thing that we got into uh, the, the the best uh, publishable state, and that was the lock login um, experience. Um, Again, Alan did a great blog post about it. Um, uh, so the, the, there was uh, 
uh, Alan, me, uh, Tobias. Uh, we had people from Endless, uh, Cosimo, and, uh, and Robin Tafel, who's also here. Um, we had Cassidy from System76. Uh, we had, uh, who did I forget? That's, uh, oh, Mario. We had Mario. Uh, so we had a combination of, of uh, you know, um, developers and, and designers. And we uh, focused on a few things, except for the, I mean, apart from the lock login things, and that was uh, the core overview, um, you know, app launching experience, um, one of the sort of um, um, not stellar uh, experiences in GNOME still remains the first boot. Um, well, that was also a part of it, we call it differently. Like the initial launch of the desktop where you end up just looking at a blank state, which is not very good. So we invested, investigated uh, solutions to the issue of how to, um, you know, um, help uh, new um, users uh, finding where all the apps are without really stepping on uh, what also is uh, the, the, a very uh, important thing in the overview and that's switching between windows. So we, we developed some uh, prototypes. Um, you can, like, that part isn't all that uh, uh, f uh, finished, but you can already look at uh, some of the prototypes that we have uh, on GitLab. Um, we looked into other things. I'm not going to go into details uh, too much, but it was a very, it was very enjoyable, um, and it was great to have uh, you know new new blood in the design team being uh, key uh, drivers in uh, the process. Um, I would also love to, since I've praised uh, the newcomers, I would also love to mention. Um, uh, Lapo Calamandre, who's a long-term contributor to GNOME, uh, usually in the in like a sidelines, uh, very rarely showing up uh, in GNOME events. Unfortunately, he's not here with us, but uh, his contributions to the visual side of things is immense, and I think uh, we should uh, give him a round of applause. Now, I'm at a point where I know I wanted to mention something, and I can't, oh yeah, so visual side of things, you can see I got beautiful slides. Um, there's, there's a thing that we've also been working on fearlessly, uh, and that is uh, driven, I don't know how I should reveal it, um, uh, for the longest of times, uh, we've had um, a very elaborate and complicated and highly detailed style for, for the app icons. Um, and sort of uh, as time went on and we're, uh, um, you know, the, the, the environment has changed and applications moved on, we're sort of in a, in a need of, of uh, stay, keeping up with with times and updating uh, um, some of that style. So we've been working uh, with uh, um, Tobias uh, Lapo and uh, Sam Hewitt um, on uh, you know, investigating a way for application developers not, or application um, not, not having to invest too much Effort into creating an app icon that fits in and uh, you know works and is visually pleasing. So that is still an ongoing uh, event that, w that that we're working on. But uh, stay tuned um, for uh, 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 tidbits that, that that we'll have and we'll have uh, something to show you. Um, I think that's unless unless the youngster will remind me of, of things that I've forgotten. Uh, that's it. So thank you. Thank you, Jakob.
Next up, we have Michael Catanzaro with the release team. Hi, everyone. Uh, okay, uh, I will actually have a short presentation. Uh, release team, uh, we've had a big year uh, in that we have uh, switched from releasing change build module sets as we've historically done to build stream project, which is a tremendous change. It was a huge amount of work. Uh, so thanks to Tristan and Javier and Abdurrahim who've been a big help with that. Um, on top of that, uh, we are planning, uh, Abdurrahim has been working on switching uh, to building the, um, well, um, I should back up. Uh, originally, when we started using the BuildStream project, we were using a Debian-based uh, base system. Abdurrahim successfully converted that to the free desktop SDK, so that was wonderful. And now he's working on switching the GNOME runtime, the Flatpak runtime, to being built from GNOME build meta instead of with uh, Flatpak builder. Uh, so we're looking to deprecate the GNOME SDK images repository, which is uh, a very important step for us because we're having trouble maintaining uh, two different sets of build metadata. We really need to get it down to just one set of build metadata. Uh, so um, GNOME SDK images is problematic right now. Uh, we are hoping to replace GNOME maps nightly as well. We can generate, uh, the, sorry, we can generate all the Flatpak, uh, all our Flatpak stuff from GNOME build meta. Uh, in the future, that will also replace GNOME continuous. And then we have, of course, deprecated the JH build module sets, so we don't have any plans to replace those. Um, am I forgetting anything? Uh, no, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's all I had, so. Thank you, Michael. Next up, we've got Andre with some bugs, uh, bug stats. No pretty slides this year, I'm afraid. He just wants a browser. <laughs> I don't know how to scroll now, but. <laughs> Test. Test? Ah, awesome. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm, I'm Andre. Um, I traditionally take a look at GNOME Bugzilla. And uh, let me try to zoom in. Um, we, until two years ago, we usually had a section here for the bug squad team, but uh, that is more or less inactive. I don't think we have many people anymore who are not also, whatever, developers, designers, translators, maintaining their bug reports in GNOME Bugzilla. Um, but of course, we still have some statistics in there. And uh, as a note, as already mentioned several times, we're migrating away from Bugzilla as a task tracking platform to GitLab. So a lot of stuff is already happening in GitLab. So um, this is not a complete thing. Um, when it comes to people who closed bug reports, um, note that some of the higher numbers, at least the, the first four items here, I know that this is also related to mass closing existing tickets that got migrated from Bugzilla to GitLab. So this does not mean that we specifically took a look at every single bug or so. It's sometimes just closing a bunch of them and then the mass action. Um, 
I probably should not tell you about the life of each of these people or teams. <laughs> uh, so these are the people uh, who close tickets in Bexilla. Uh, of course, we also have people reporting. These are your five seconds to read names until I scroll. Um, then, uh, Bugzilla, we, we used it now that we have GitLab with, with uh, pull or merge requests, not anymore, but we also used it to uh, sometimes put patches in there. Of course, maintainers or, or developers also put patches directly in, into uh, the code repository. So again, this is not a uh, complete view or something like that. And uh, if somebody put a patch into Bexilla or attached it to a ticket in there, there's also somebody who reviews these. Um, please give applause to those people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and again, as a note, as we're migrating away from GitLab and uh, hopefully going to close more of all these projects still listed here, or at least make the system read only. Um, there is, I was told, a GitLab session on Monday morning in the boffs, and I'm mentioning this because uh, at least I'm not aware yet of uh, similar statistics for GitLab. So if anybody feels like hacking up something or knows it exists or likes to use the API, so we have similar statistics next year here, uh, that would be lovely. Thank you. Next up, we have three with the engagement team. I heard there's a bazillion slides. I hope they all have pretty pictures. What? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, this is my report for the engagement team. Oops, that's the wrong one, sorry. All right, so uh, first up, uh, I want to talk about um, GNOME Asia 2017, uh, the keynotes, but um, that was in October 2017 in Chongqing, China. Uh, we had over 400 attendees. Uh, we really focused on um, GNOME user outreach, um, and a lot of that was students. Uh, we, we, we reached out to a lot of them, and uh, it was great. Afterwards, we, we had a lot of positive uh, comments. In fact, we got at least one GSOC student out of that. Uh, so that was good. good. Uh, here are some of, we, some of the pictures here. We celebrated the GNOME uh, 20th birthday in Chongqing. Uh, we had a fire dance with fire and things like that. It was awesome. And a great cake and strange liquor. So uh, when it goes out to outreach, um, we had uh, this is uh, we have two uh, outreach programs in GNOME that, that we're involved in. One is Outreachy, the other one is GSOC, of course. Um, for Outreachy, we had uh, one intern. Um, for GNOME recipes, um, with GSOC, we had 19 interns um, working on Builder, uh, Calendar, Disks, and Wayland, um, and. Um, uh, Carlos and Yuri, uh, right? Yeah, you're looking at me strange. Anyway, okay, so we, we, there were two workshops uh, that were organized in Brno and Gion. And here is a list of last year's uh, uh, interns. Um, they showed up, and also some designers that decided to crash it. So. <laughs> So getting down to Hackfests. So we, the, the key, thing, key point here, we had 10 Hackfests uh, in the last 12 months, and that is up from four from last year. Um, Hackfests are a great way for all of us to get together and plan uh, the various par parts of the infrastructure in GNOME and in the platform. So we would like to continue doing much more of that next year. Um, uh, this, this is an important thing, so we have budget, let's do this. Events. Um, GNOME members uh, have been attending various conferences uh, around the world. Um, so some of them, these are, these are really important for us. 
uh, visibility is something uh, as a project, we need to be at other conferences. We need to show we're involved, we're there, uh, and especially technical uh, talks would be appreciated. Um, so that's what we have for events. And we have some pictures, of course. Um, we have uh, pictures from Indonesia. Uh, we had one in Turkey, uh, Colombia. There's Naritzi. Uh, and um, in uh, uh, Mexico. So. Okay, uh, other highlights. Um, the big news for us, just like the rest of you, we moved to GitLab as well. So uh, we have now completely aligned with the rest of the development process. Uh, so everything we do now is on GitLab. Uh, and because of that, we've actually experienced some growth. We, we've added some great new members uh, with a huge number of diverse skill sets. Finally, uh, we've also, the t that growth is also reflected in our team. We've got, we have actually have many members from Kenya, China, Peru, and Turkey. So uh, we've been seeing some great diversity in our own team. So this is great news. So what are we gonna do this coming year? So we want more activities. Um, with the uh, foundation expansion, um, we're gonna be doing a lot more things out there. Uh, you already saw that we have an engagement committee. Uh, that new committee is responsible with a budget. We're, we'll be able to help sponsor parties. Uh, uh, hack, uh, not Hackfest, but uh, if there if there's like release parties then things like that uh, if you want stickers for your events uh, those are all things that we can do on, on the engagement committee uh, we also want to spend more time doing more outreach to newcomers uh, you know diversity is something that's really important to us in order for gnome to grow we need to be, and attract more developers we need we need everybody else we need uh, we need writers we need uh, our graphic artists and so forth. So that's something that's a big target for us. So engage with us. Um, we're not just an external um, engagement team. Uh, we're also internal. If you need something uh, regarding to messaging, if there is uh, something you're doing that might have a public impact, uh, it's worth discussing with us. We can help you uh, with with the right kind of positive messaging. Uh, so please come out and talk to us. Uh, more importantly, if you're doing something exciting, an experiment, or fly on me. Um, so uh, experiment or things like that, uh, that would be fabulous. Uh, we would love to promote you. Uh, that's something the engagement team is really loves to do. So make us excited. Come out and tell us what, what you're doing. Um, so ultimately, we're here to support you uh, and support everyone in this project. Uh, and you can do that, by as I told you, we're all on GitLab. So if you want to open a ticket on our engagement uh, GitLab part and let us know. That's it, thanks. Okay, so as people finish settling down into their seats, we're just going to go ahead and start the Q&A. This is your chance to ask us anything you want, um, and we'll you know, kind of answer it together as a board. Um, so any initial questions? Yes. It's you. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, so, like, with all of the expansion of the foundation and stuff, it, has there been any talk about GNOME OS? Mm. Good question. Okay. So, GNOME OS. Um, we have not begun to discuss that yet, and I think that um, there are a lot of really cool opportunities sort of presenting themselves as a result of this, uh, of the anonymous donation, like it stirred up some hype or um, some really good, um, yeah, new opportunities for us. So 
I personally am a little interested in this idea of a GNOME OS, <laughs> but yes, much more to be discussed. There's been nothing concrete. Do other board members have anything to say about this? I, I, um, I, I feel like a lot of the, the stuff that's happened up to this point from the idea of GNOME OS has actually already arrived and delivered a lot of changes to us. So GNOME Continuous has kind of pushed forward this idea of, of continuous integration and continuous delivery of GNOME, which has kind of spurred on you know, other projects around Flatpak and, and BuildStream. So we, we're kind of running on an evolution of, of GNOME defining, defining the stack all the way down to the kernel actually allows us to do better engineering of the platform. Um, so that's, that's kind of happening in a sense. Um, as to do we want to get into security updates and things, well, there's a kind of question that the free desktop SDK is currently kind of looking at. Um, they don't have a kernel either, um, but it's, it's um, yeah. All right, so this is also somewhat expansion related, and I want to say it very carefully so I'm not misinterpreted. Uh, the hiring of people uh, to, especially like to, to do work on the code itself was phrased as though it's, it's a one-year initial experiment sort of thing. Is that fair? Um, so I guess what I'm wondering is, at that one-year mark, how will you assess whether or not that investment has paid off in the way that it was expected to? And I don't mean whether or not the people did their jobs right, but whether or not that was what you wanted from the investment. So I think the the two ways that we have to get the, those feedback are usually like the advisory board members and the community. And I think usually we get those kind of feedback quite clearly. So I think we will continue to do that, uh, seeing how the community feels about uh, the progress in, in, in there and see how the advisory board members feels about the progress in there, if we actually make a good investment there or not or what we can modify. And also the positions that we're hiring for, I mean, one of them, the development managers to help us fundraise, and you know, we can see both how successful that is and also it's a clear you know, need for the foundation. Um, program director, I mean, uh, the ones that we've authorized help give us more capacity in areas that we would really like to you know, invest in. Um, and so then it's really just, uh, up to can we sustain the salaries? It's not so much an experiment in our mind as more so, you know, we're continuing to uh, analyze our reserve policy, for example, to see, you know, how if, if we're unable to fundraise, then how does that affect the employees and everything? So, in uh, that's why the board hack fest in September we're targeting October, actually October, um, will be really important for us to really think about. Um, you know the uh, the budget, and then how our reserves policy will evolve to help um, maintain the positions. And um, I think we'll we'll have to set a lot of checkpoints to see, you know, do we start cutting? Do we start expanding even more, et cetera? So, lots to be decided and talked about, and we're already thinking about that. So I have a <clears throat> somewhat related question. So, uh, um, Carlos, you mentioned during the numbers uh, that y you have a tendency to be conservative, and we're going from one employee to uh, five. Is that right? Well, it doesn't really matter. But um, um, so I'm a bit concerned. Obviously, I don't have the numbers so with me, and, and you probably have a better picture. But I'm, I'm a bit concerned that that if we don't manage to get fund, uh, you know, that kind of level of funding in a more sustainable way that we we might spike and then go. And, and I'm wondering, have you considered that? Have you considered maybe hiring less? And I, I guess I'm asking for some context as to why we came up with the number of four employees and how sustainable do we think that is? So um, one thing that we um, we kind of see is that the the overall effectiveness of the foundation is sort of to do with how much money we get in and then how we spend it. Um, so the I mean I think it was Rosanna that said this that typically if the board has too many newcomers then 
they're not quite sure what to do and they'll it sort of default to like, okay, we'll keep the money, don't spend the money. And then in a sense, you have a kind of a lull of activity. So we, we're trying to correct against that basically. We're trying to say, well, look, we've got this money now. This is an opportunity that we need to step up to. So we are taking more risk with that money and we're saying look, we're gonna spend it in a year. We're not gonna spend it over three years or five years. But the goal of that is to increase the activity on the fundraising and on the delivery of those, of, of those goals. Um, so we need to kind of step both of them up. We can't just like go out and fundraise and then spend it on 10 hackfests, right? We need to go out and fundraise and show we're going we're gonna to move the needle. We're going to do some good stuff with this money. Um, and that's, that's kind of the main risk mitigation factor is that we're, we're increasing both sides of the equation uh, to try and get the matched funding next year, to try and get more funding so that this is the start of a, a sustained growth period and, and, and a, you know, the graph keeps going in that direction. Um, but, you know, we do have the risk in mind, right? These are fixed fixed uh, length positions you know obviously the hope is that we renew all of those and more um, but you know we can't write checks with money that we don't have so we're trying to take a balanced approach where we kind of put more in and get more out and so we are kind of going bang on both sides of that um, but that's so that we can be more effective and we can keep the, the trend upwards Um, so regarding the fundraising, um, in that process, uh, is there are, are, is the foundation going to be beholden to their fundraisers in some way? Is I guess what I'm saying is, is there some way that it bleeds into the project? Like because if you're trying to get more money from sponsors, is there some influence you're going to put on the project to go a certain way or move a certain way or what it is? I mean, there. The influx of money is corruption to some extent, right? So, so how do we manage uh, to keep being technically uh, strident to our goals, but also please sponsors, right? I mean, or, or, or fundraisers. So, I, I, it's. I mean, there's a couple of answers to that. Um, I think one of them is. It's this meeting, right? It's the process where the community and the foundation members hold the board to account, um, and we need that. That's good. Um, so this will be a, a kind of evolution and a discussion because we, you know, we, we've kind of sent out some, some some trial balloons, and this is our plan for now. But what do we do next year? We haven't written that plan yet, so um, we need to to kind of iterate on that. Um, in the specific fundraising um, thing. Uh, because we are a 501c3, we are, we're a non-profit, we must act according to our mission and according to our charter. So if someone turns up with a big check and says, here's some money, you, you have to do this. Um, one of our it's a legal responsibility of the board is to check that the activities of the foundation are consistent with the charter. So we can't say yes to money that, that takes us away from what the foundation was set to do and supporting the project. Um, so, you know, legally we can't do that. I think morally and, and you know, with our kind of social contract with the, the gnome community, we, we can't do that either. Um, so I personally hope that we're not going to fall in this trap. I, I hope my fellow board members would agree with me. Um, so, you know, keep us honest. That's, uh, it's good to ask. It's good to keep asking and, and to make sure that, that what we're doing kind of plays into a successful project and, and the foundation, you know, does its job. Okay, um, I would like to ask about the events code of conduct. As far as I understand it, uh, it requires that any organizer, basically, that the foundation has quite has certain powers over the organization of conferences and requirements for the organizers. I'm wondering how this works if the event is co-hosted with another event where you would have conflicting um, interests from various organizations and how the board intends to resolve these kinds of issues. Uh, yeah, if this question came up the other day in the in the mailing list, uh, if we have a GNOME event co-hosted with another conference, we of course cannot control the the the, co the code of conduct for the whole joint conference, but we can definitely control the we can say what's acceptable behavior and not in the GNOME spaces within the conference. For example, within within uh, GNOME sessions in, in, the, in the GNOME rooms in that conference. If there are like uh, specific parts of the hallways where the GNOME people are, will be in the you know, GNOME parties within that conference, we can, we can enforce the code of conduct there. 
we definitely need to draw up a set of guidelines that we can just hand down to conference organizers so that they are not uh, so that everything is clear for them and they know what to do. So does that answer your question? Okay, so I wanted to uh, go back a little bit to the um, positions you're hiring for and particularly the idea of hiring somebody to do some development on GDK. Uh, I mean, historically, when we first founded the GNOME Foundation, I think one question we got a lot was whether we were gonna hire people to actually write code and at that point, you know, 20 years ago in very different conditions, we said unequivocally that the role of the foundation was not to write code, it was only to provide supporting roles for that. Uh, so I, you know, and as I said, things are not the same as they were 20 years ago, and some of the maybe things we saw in other organizations that were problems, you know, maybe aren't currently problems. But I just wanted to ask about how you thought about that role and, in, in, and putting the, the foundation into that um, segment of the uh, Community. Um, I've been wondering what uh, uh, such a developer, what goals such a developer would have, and, and, and how how he would be motivated. Like, I, if I'm going to reject one of his patches because I think the feature is stupid, who is he going to tell that to? And how is that going to work? So I think regardless of what, uh, you know, we hire or whatever, the power is always in the community and, and the hierarchy there is clear, right? There is a maintainer, there is developers. That's go not going to change. Uh, the non-foundation is just investing in, uh, you know, in people. And of course, I think the, the big advantage here is that we have direct control uh, like the community that has that control on the board and, 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 and this employee as well. So you can, you know, uh, kind of try to redirect where, where we need that. Um, so I think it's more like an advantage more than a disadvantage, uh, what you say, I think. Or I don't know if other board members. Um, maybe you could compare it in that case to, uh, for example, a, a developer funded on Patreon or something. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, if you know if somebody starts a Patreon campaign to implement a certain thing um, and sends a patch to you and you reject that patch, uh, you, know, um, the, you know the Patreon community also doesn't have any power over you in that case. I mean, I I, I think it also works in the same way as any anyone else here who has a, a salary that pays them to, to sit at the computer and do work on the open source project, right? If your boss comes in and says, like, can you land this really crappy thing in GTK? What do you say, right? No. So, I mean, they have to, they have to do the community job that they're hired to do, otherwise they're not performing. If they constantly send in lame patches and they're always rejected, then we haven't got the right developer. So. Um, I have a question that's kind of related. Um, so with the idea of hiring developers, there's always been a, like a separation between the foundation and the project, and the foundation board doesn't control the direction of the project. But in this case, since the foundation board is going to be deciding what positions to hire for, there will be some kind of overlap or some change in the role of the board. And I was wondering, how do you see that playing out and uh, what role the community feedback is going to play in that? Well, one of the things is that um, while the foundation can't set the technical direction, there's have been ways that we've influenced it in the past, and those are through, for example, helping to organize targeted hack fest to have a certain, you know, uh, advance in in a technology that we support, or you know, um, just kind of broadly setting these goals. And so, I think that there's always been some level of influence that the foundation has had on the project, and our, the responsibility is to help, you know, make. Um, the GNOME project thrive and grow. And so we think that by funding these positions, we are um, giving more capacity to teams and to just, you know, help 
advance the core technologies that are so important for the entire project to, to keep growing. Anything else? I, I think the other, to, to, to add to that, is, is the same idea that the, um, the board is not going to be down in the weeds on this. We actually want to have the reporting structure where the staff will report to Neil, who has experience as an engineering manager, and, and that's to do with the, you know, are people happy, are they productive, are they, you know, making, you know, doing, doing effective work in the community. But in terms of the technical direction, that will be you know, accountable to and from the community. That will be their contributions and the acceptance and the consensus that has driven the project to, to this point. Um, so we, should be, we shouldn't be in that. That will come from the project. Um, and we're not, we're not trying to change that equation um, beyond what Richie says, which is we look for the, the things that are you know, good for the foundation to back, and then we, we back them. But, but that's, that's not us putting them in, into the, the project. That's us taking them from the project and, and resourcing them. So uh, curiosity question. Presuming since I cannot ask for the name and address of the mysterious uh, donation, um, I'm just wondering if it is an individual co donation or a corporate donation. If that's an appropriate question to ask, I don't know. I think that the donor wants to remain completely anonymous. Um, I would have to ask Neil about that because he's the one handling that relationship. Okay. So maybe this question isn't applicable here, but uh, like a blog post came about redesigning the lock screen in GNOME. So when it asked the design team, what's the status on that? Uh, does it seem fit to um, be released in GNOME 3.30, or is it just still an idea right now? That's not quite the right forum for that question. Um, I think the answer is find the maintainer or someone who's motivated to work on a lock screen and ask them the same question. But I don't know who that is. <laughs> but thank you for being brave and ask. And we want to help you get answers by pointing you to the right person. <laughs> so, um, uh, I do wonder, have you, have you taken into account that, um, uh, okay, let me give you some context and then I'll, I'll ask the question. So in the past, I've, I've known that we've struggled to get more advisory board members because the value of becoming an advisory board member, it's, it's sometimes hard to justify. And, like, and some companies prefer to sponsor WADEC than to become uh, an advisory board member. Have you thought how these hires might impact that? And have, are we thinking about, have we, have we, uh, have we chosen those roles to kind of um, um, encourage some more uh, advisory board members coming? Have we reached out to companies maybe? Uh, or, or was that completely out of the, uh, decision process about which roles we were hiring for? So in, in my knowledge, um, I think uh, Neil was uh, talking with different advisory board members uh, before creating the roles. Uh, so yeah, there has been some feedback around there. sort of wanted to add something to that, but I'm not sure. Um, just that um, I think part of your question was, in general, kind of like, are we thinking about attracting new advisory board members and how the hires will impact it? OK. It's being recorded, yeah. No, I, I was more uh, trying to put in the table the notion that maybe, we, for example, the UTK maintainer hire. I, I've heard, and we've heard in this forum in other years, uh, uh, companies complaining about, well, GDK doesn't work well on phones, and my company cares about phones. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't see how us investing. So are we th uh, if we haven't thought about it, maybe um, now that the roles are out there, we can uh, 
I think it, it would be nice if the board took that into account where selecting which priorities those roles are going to have because it might help us justify uh, towards potential advisory board members, hey, is there a GTK uh, feature that you might, it, this is just an example, it can be about the other roles as well, is there a GTK feature they might want to prioritize because maybe with your funding uh, we, we can make that happen. That's something we couldn't do before that we can do now uh, because that separation between the, f the foundation cannot uh, prioritize any given developer's uh, agenda that changes now, and that might be a, a you know a, a possibility. So, I think that's to be taken into account uh, both by Neil and the new development. Uh, uh, is it development coordinator? Program? Or something? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. you know the role <laughs> I'm talking about, yes. right? Is it um, the new money maker, right? Um, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so I'm just putting it out there for the board to take into account while prioritizing with Neil uh, the the task of each role because it might help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think an important thing to say is just that, you know, um, up until now we've only had one, two employees at most for a foundation, and so in order to really, like, grow the project and achieve that next level, um, we need to have more people working full-time to, you know, run the foundation aspect and everything. And so now with an executive director, now with, you know, additional hires, we hope that communication between our executive director and advisory board members will be greater. And, you know, there will be more conversation. And, you know, this is just the first year, so I can't say that we have done that well so far. But, you know, in this upcoming year, it's a chance to start really improving the communication with our advisory board members and um, getting more of their input, et cetera. Um, I really do think that by having both the executive director and the development manager, you know, we will be able to achieve that next level of fundraising and just in general, um, you know, be able to support the community with more resources. So, yeah. Other questions? Okay. I have one. So uh, basically, all of us know the Economic Foundation is expanding. So is there any plans for expanding the Economic Foundation member, the, the numbers of how many people are in the Economic Foundation member? So is there any plans for, for this kind of expansion? We've always looked to have all contributors join as Foundation members. and. As the foundation expands, we expect to have more contributors as a result of that, and therefore grow the foundation membership as well. Any last questions? So other than the expansion, what would be your top five challenges this year that you believe that the foundation needs to tackle? Other than the expansion? Yes, other than the expansion. Um, I mean, we hope to set some goals again at the board Hackfest. We uh, actually, Guadec was the first meeting with a new board, so we, you know, are really just starting out, and we need to have a chance to get together as a new board and set our goals. Um, I think that you know, just tackling the challenges that the expansion will present us with is going to be a major part of our focus. Um, but as I said, like we started a whole bunch of stuff last year. We created all these new policies. We created new committees. Um, there's not as much visibility around all of that as there should be. And so part of it is like helping the community know which resources are available to them, how to access them, and kind of improve processes around that to make it easy. Um, yeah, other than that, as I said, we haven't really okay. set goals as a, as a board. I have one last question. Okay. Um, so the, the way the foundation is set up, you have you know, seven directors, and the executive director reports to the seven directors. 
the attitude of the boards can change from year to year, right? And you know, these are your priorities, but next year a different, completely, a completely different board could take over, may have a completely different set of. How do we, how, have you thought about consistency uh, when dealing with uh, now, you know, uh, six, seven people, uh, and who the exec, I mean, they report to the executive, executive director, but the executive director is now, uh, is reporting to a boss that changes dynamically from one year to the next, and is is pulled along. So how how do you how do you firewall uh, and, and keep something consistent uh, that at least consistent for the next five years or whatever it is? Yeah. So, so uh, we are learning, and we actually are going to be. Um, uh, consulting with a, somebody who's been really involved in nonprofits um, and has a lot of experience with those to just learn from them a bit more because we want to make sure we set up solid foundations to be able to then, as you said, not you know have a boss that fluctuates constantly. Um, some ideas that we've had in the past are sort of staggering the elections, the board elections, and maybe having two-year terms and maybe having them you know so that there's only two or three positions at a time that have turnover so that there's some consistency, et cetera. Those are just ideas that we've talked about, but as I said, I think we're really eager to learn from um, somebody who has real expertise in this domain. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add that in the whole time I've been involved with GNOME, we've never actually had a 100% changeover on the board. There has always been around half of the board who've remained onto a second year while well, half got replaced. And in some cases, the new members had actually been on the board before as well. Um, the other thing is when members run for the board, they are actually very often aware of the long-term aims of the board, and that is taken into consideration by the membership when they vote as well. So all of you have a say in that. I think we have only five minutes left for the pants ceremony, but if you promise to be really quick, maybe we can do yours. Okay, one minute. Uh, we were talking about the community being able to view basically what the um, employees are doing and having scrutiny that way. And currently, um, I'm wondering if there will be like a requirement for the employees to like blog regularly or something like that, and how that is also applicable to the executive director and other employees of the foundation. So actually, that's an agenda item we have to discuss because uh, I think it's important to to have some uh, like. A big transparency between the, the, the board, uh, the employees, the employees and the community, the community and the board, and you know this kind of uh, triangle that we have. Uh, so yeah, we have to discuss how that's going to work, and it's, it's a priority, at least for me, and I think for the board uh, to to you know uh, achieve that. Okay, and so I'm going to end the board Q and A and move on to um, some later. Stuff okay. Let's see, the pants award, um, and I mentioned this before, but the pants award goes to somebody who has made um, real impact in the gnome community, um, and I don't know. The, okay, I sort of know the origin story, but I do you know the origin story better than I do? Okay. <laughs> Jeff Waugh? Is that the guy? Okay. Yeah, if, if, if I may. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Apparently some, uh, you know, a, a very important GNOME contributor used to say that he knew Spanish and um, would always just say, ¿Dónde están mis pantalones? Which translates to, where are my pants? And as people were walking around one night, um, somebody found like pants in a gutter or something and said, there are your pants. And so then the joke became like, here are the pants for this guy. And they gave him it, it gave them to him as an award um, at the end of a Guadalc. So we've continued that tradition and now give pants to somebody who has had, uh, made a major contribution to our project. They are so, the pants of thanks. <laughs> yes, that, the pants a, of that's thanks. That's the complete name. 
And just to clarify, it's fresh pants each year. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) The way this works is that we're going to give you clues to see if you can guess who it is. So we're going to start off with a bit broad criteria and then move on to more specific. This person is always there when you need them. The person dances like no one is watching. This person cooks great food. (gasps) They're an unending source of energy and positivity for events and engagement. They can't look grumpy, no matter how hard they try. (laughs) And they get excellent references from all sorts of GNOME community members, past, present, uh, just is loved. This year (laughs) is my great honor to present Shree with the pants. 